Hey guys, today I'm down in Desert Hot Springs, California, taking a look at the new Ionic 5. This is the first non-Tesla in America to have the Tesla charge port. Yep, the new J3400 NECS charge port. Let's see how this charges because, key thing to know, the Ionic 5 does not charge as quickly at a Tesla supercharger station as it will at an Electrify America station. Also, we don't have plug and charge support yet. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the Tesla app and we're gonna find the charging place. You can see right there, charge here. And then we're gonna find the post number. This is post number 1C. It will eventually load. There we go, so we're at 1C. There we go, start charging. And then we get to find out if this cord is long enough because Hyundai has the charge door on the opposite side of the vehicle. But fortunately, it's right there at the back. So it actually should work. So it says attach adapter and plug in. So we just check and see how that's going. Warns us it may take up to two minutes to start charging. And hey, charging has started. Uh, so you can see over here, we are now charging at 19, 20 kilowatts. So it is ticking up there. I'm just gonna grab my time-lapse camera here and uh, move it along so we get a nice clean time-lapse of this charging session. And then uh, we'll see how long it takes, guys. While we wait for the charging to complete, let's talk about why this is charging slower than at an Electrify America station. The voltage of this particular pack, according to the spec sheet, is 697 volts. It's important to remember that when they're talking about 800 or 400 volt systems, there's obviously a range. 800 volt vehicles are basically everything that's over about 500 volts nominal. Now, the way we get this 800 volt EV to charge from a 400 volt station is by an interesting DC-DC conversion technique that Hyundai is using. It's integrated into the rear motor electronic module, and it uses one of the loops on the electric motor as an induction loop. And that allows them to boost the voltage incoming from about 400 volts on up to the 700 or so volts required to get this battery to its full charge. That process is not perfect. A, there is loss, but B, there's also a limit to how much power the onboard system was designed to convert. And it looks like it's right around 127 kilowatts. We'll see if that number gets any higher when we talk about how this charging session went. That is why 10% to 80% in this vehicle should take about 30 minutes. Of course, on the screen, it was saying 31 minutes from 13% to 80%, rather than just 20 minutes at an Electrify America station. Because at an Electrify America or an EVgo or another 800 volt station, like the upcoming V4 Tesla stations, they're gonna natively be able to provide this vehicle with the voltage that this battery wants to charge as rapidly as possible. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. The other thing that we should mention is that adapters are going to be a way of life. I have to say they've actually positioned that connector really nicely, so it does work. We're in the charging stall, chargers plugged in, we're not occupying the wrong space or anything like that, so nothing to worry about. But uh, here's what the adapters look like. So on this side, we have the CCS2 J3400 adapter that will be required for charging as fast as possible in these vehicles. You can see CCS input there, NACS output right there. Also, you will need one for AC charging if your level two charger or level one charger at home is not an NACS charger. And that's because NACS shares pins. So on a CCS connector, these are the DC pins, these are the AC pins. On this side, these pins are DC and AC. So that's why you need both. You can't actually have them all connected at the same time. As promised, here is the charging curve. As you can see, it's probably the least curvy charging curve I've ever seen. Things bump up to 127 kilowatts really darn rapidly, and then it just hangs out there basically all the way till 80%, at which point things join the regular charging curve that you would see if we had connected this to an 800 volt charging station. By 90%, it's averaged 117 kilowatts. That drops down to an average of 108 kilowatts all the way full. Now we did start this battery at 12%, not 10%. However, in this 12% to 80% window, I had expected it to take a little bit less time than 30 minutes. It actually took 32 and a half minutes, so a little bit longer than Hyundai's specification. Now we should talk about this DC-DC conversion technology here because Hyundai says that they're continuing to tweak things and the entire vehicle is over there updatable. So if they can continue to tweak things and improve the charge rates, maybe we could actually get beyond 127 kilowatts in this conversion. 
Importantly, there have been hardware changes for the 2025 Ionic 5, although they weren't overly specific about exactly what has changed. If you have a pre-refreshed Ionic 5 with the upcoming free adapter that Hyundai will be sending everybody, you may not get 127 kilowatts in that DC-DC conversion. In our initial testing, it looks like it's going to be around 100 kilowatts, so not too, too much slower, but definitely slower than the 2025. We should know more about that once those adapters come online. Now again, because we get so many questions about this, let me again be very clear what's going on here. Tesla V3 and prior stations, and actually most V4 stations in the wild, are 400 volt charging stations. And by 400 volts, I don't mean exactly 400 volts. They operate from a range of around 200 volts for some really older EVs out there, up to about 500 volts or just below. Some of the Tesla stations appear to top out at around 455 or maybe 475 volts, somewhere in that range. It's definitely a range, and that's the important thing to keep in mind. So when we're talking about 800 volt EVs, this gets critical with other EVs out there and other charging curves, we're basically talking about anything above 500 volts. So 500 all the way on up to 1,000 volts. If we take a look at Lucid's, for instance, they're really close to 1,000 volts, but they're still an 800 volt EV. Now, Tesla had said that V4 charging stations would be 1,000 volt native, and there is an asterisk there. The station pedestals are 1,000 volt designed and compliant, but for most V4 stations out there, including all the ones in my neck of the woods, at least for the moment, they are actually backed by cabinets, the actual rectification hardware from a V3 station. So behind the scenes, it's V3, customer facing, it's V4. That is being updated, and apparently the newest, newest V4 stations out there in the US are fully 1000 volt compliant. So if you can plug your Cybertruck in, and get the max charge rate on that one, then you can actually plug an Ionic 5 into that same station and you could get the full charging rate of about 257 kilowatts on that as well and that really fast charging time. The reason you should keep this in mind is because we don't know what schedule Tesla is going to follow to upgrade their V3 stations to V4 stations. The Cybertruck is the only Tesla that can do that and after that it's going to be their partner vehicles out there in the wild. So by and large, actually, there are more non-Tesla 800 volt EVs out there. I don't know how encouraged Tesla is going to be to upgrade, remains to be seen. We had hoped that the Juniper refresh of the Tesla Model Y would bring an 800 volt native pack. In fact, it did not. It is still a 400 volt pack in the new refreshed Model Y. And that may factor into the timing of the upgrade. Again, adapters are gonna be the way of life. If you want to charge your Ionic 5, fastest possible, you're going to want to find an EVgo or an Electrify America or a ChargePoint or any of the other 800 volt CCS stations out there. If you want the most reliable charging network currently in the US, you want to deal with the late rate limitation at a supercharger station. Now, a lot of folks have asked me, what about 400 volt CCS stations? Yes, they do exist, but in North America, and this is the critical part, in North America, it is pretty rare to find a high output 400 volt station. In Europe, it's a little bit easier to find, but we're talking about here. And in Canada, Mexico, the United States, most 400 volt stations, they do exist, are actually the 60 to 80 kilowatt output stations and below. A lot of those stations that were installed at the beginning of the CCS era, when the Chevy Bolt was released and the BMW i3 was released, it's that era of station that you may find at Whole Foods or whatever, those are going to be the old 400 volt stations. Their low output means that the conversion limit on the Ionic 5, it's not going to be a problem because you're going to get basically full throughput with the losses involved there, of course. Importantly, the 150 kilowatt CCS stations that you see everywhere out there from Electrify America, EVgo, and all of the other newer charger vendors, those are not 400 volt stations. They're just output limited to 150 kilowatts. They will still support natively the higher voltage charging required in an Ionic 5. So the slowest DC fast charging is going to be at the supercharger station where you're going to be limited to 127 kilowatts. Then a 150 kilowatt EA station or similar is going to top out at logically about 150 kilowatts. Then if you plug into a 200 kilowatt station, you're going to again get 200 kilowatts. You'll find those, the shared posts, for instance, at the new IANA stations, 
Those will deliver 200 kilowatts or 400 if nobody's charging next to you. And then the 350 kilowatt EA stations and similar out there will be able to max the car out at its 257 kilowatts peak. So hopefully that explains everything and how this charge curve works. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And was Hyundai right to make the switch this soon to the new J3400 charge connector? Or do you think they should have waited and instead have had adapters from J3400 to this. I would say whether or not this turns out to be a good decision really is gonna depend on how rapidly we see the deployment of J3400 connectors in the wild and importantly, updated 800 volt compliant V4 stations from Tesla. See all of you later.